Okay, our next speaker is Professor Patrick Gray. He is professor in the Department of Psychiatry uh, in Melbourne, and he's also executive director of Origin and professor of the Youth Mental Health um, Center and founding editor of the Early Intervention in Psychiatry. And we welcome you. And your, the talk that he's giving is on new directions in early stage mental illness, new diagnosis, and clinical trial innovation. Well, thanks very much, Marty. And, um... First of all, I'd just like to say I'm the B team, I'm afraid. Um, uh, my colleague, Barnaby Nelson, uh, who's, who's really been driving the prescient study in Melbourne, uh, couldn't be here, so she had to put up with me this afternoon, I'm afraid. So, but I would like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me and my colleagues. And I want to give a shout out to my prescient colleagues here in the front row, um, who many of you would have met, and uh, of course, This is our view of the world. This is the prescient view of the world. Um, and uh, just want to give a shout out to my whole prescient team, particularly Barnaby and, and uh, all the work they've been doing, which I'm going to touch on, I guess. Now, I, I don't know if I could get through all this, so I might skip over this first part. There are two parts of this talk. First, about diagnosis and the problems that we have with the phenotype. You, you heard some of the grappling with that um, already today. And the second part is about how we uh, are going with the treatment of this clinical high risk stage. And uh, I'll just send you some data, which is about to appear uh, in a couple of weeks in general psychiatry as well. So, four years ago, believe it or not, maybe it's three years ago, in, uh, three years ago in uh, Amsterdam, we held a workshop, um, which many of the people in the room were at, or some of the people in the room were at. Um, Josh Gordon was there. Um, and people came together who've been working on new approaches to diagnosis in psychiatry. And uh, I think that this quote from the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci sums up where we're at. We, we, uh, we know that the, the current system is no good and it's just, just not fit for purpose. It's been criticized a lot in recent years, especially around the time the DSM-5 came out. But we can't seem to give birth to a new, a new system that's better. So, the, so we're really stuck between a rock and a hard place in many ways. And of course, the criticisms of psychiatry um, and psychiatric diagnosis continue in, 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 the, in the media and in the public and clinicians working with the current system realize every day is limitation. So, but can we move, move forward? That, that, that was the purpose of this um, workshop. In... Sorry, I'm just going to again. So this is the workshop. Um, um, we, we had an, an incredible two days, um, and a paper was, was written for Lancet Psychiatry, which has not yet seen the light of day because COVID sort of intervened. And actually, the first COVID case in Amsterdam was diagnosed on the day we got the, the workshop in the hospital where we were. So, so we immediately jumped on the plane the next day and went home. Um, and there's this tension about diagnosis in, in, the, in the literature. You can see that on the left, people who are looking for a paradigm shift, that, that includes me and Jim Van Os wrote this paper with me um, back about 10 years ago. And more recently, I would say the conservative faction fought back and, and uh, a paper by Dan Stein in World Psychiatry basically arguing for, let's just accept the strengths of the current system. Maybe with incrementalism, we can move forward slowly. So, and maybe there is a middle ground, but advances in, 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 in science usually come through paradigm shifts but we're not quite sure what the paradigm shift is actually going to be. So that, that was the purpose of this workshop, to work on, on that front. Well, I won't go through all this, but this, these, are, these are sections of the paper, which is nearly finished now. It's been revived and updated. And what we try to do is we bring we brought together the people who developed the RDOC criteria, the people who, the network internationally, that have been working on ITOP and our own clinical staging framework. These seems to be the, the new ways of looking at, at this. And also, I would say network theory and network analysis were prominent in the workshop as well, which is another approach which 
the trouble is none of these approaches are sufficient in themselves and, and um, we try to work out where the ways to integrate these different approaches and a lot of this the reason it's relevant today is because a lot of this thinking particularly around the clinical staging emerged from the clinical high risk concept a lot of the insights that came from that uh, gave rise to this with some of these wider ideas so operationally defining early clinical phenotypes not just for risk of psychosis but more broadly across the early stages of emerging mental illness um, so they, they they have to require intervention in their own right so there has to be a clinical need and then they also have to note risk for more persistent and recurrent and even what Deanna was presenting even even subtle symptom fragments in, in children if they are associated with persistence and risk for later later conditions then that's something that we're interested in studying as a, as a, as a staging type idea now these early phenotypes may not be markers of specific diseases or or disorders but they they might be pluripotential they, they might need it in a number of different directions and and they might be associated with certain biosignatures um, if you think back to Dominic's talk this morning the the biotypes and Kesh was talking about that too so um, and of course treatments you know app schizophrenia would love to deliver a specific treatment for the clinical high-risk phenotype but there are hardly any treatments in psychiatry that are, that are not transdiagnostic. So that's probably not the way it's going to pan out. If, if new therapeutic agents are, whether it's cannabidiol or anything else, they're probably going to have effects beyond the current syndrome or concepts. Uh, if you look at all the other treatments apart from possibly lithium, lithium is the only treatment that stops that degree of specificity in the whole of psychiatry. So, so this is some of the thinking and what we came up with was this idea of a, of a working towards an integrated ecosystem of diagnostic thinking and approaches that could somehow be much more practical and useful not just for clinicians and patients but also for researchers because there's an idea that the current diagnostic system has, has held us back in a research sense and i think that was some of the thinking of the art of for example too so anyway that workshop happened so slipping back now into um, clinical high risk world, we know that even when you're defining a, a phenotype with, where the target end state is meant to be psychosis and schizophrenia, you have a lot of variability in the course, the trajectory over time. So some people will make a transition, some people will continue on with the some threshold of psychotic symptoms, some people will make a remission and recovery from maybe about a third or, or 40%. But some of those people relapse and you get recurrences too. So it's it's something that also is associated with other syndromes, not just the psychotic dimension. And we did a number of years ago, a follow-up study showed that only 7% of people did not meet diagnostic criteria from the clinical high-risk state if you follow them up. And the most common actually syndrome patterns were not psychosis, but mood disorders and, and, uh, and anxiety disorders and, and, other, and other, other issues like that, which we choose to say are comorbid with the, the psychotic dimension, but actually, you know, um, it just shows the diversity of the syndrome patterns, even in the early stage. And that's actually a good thing because if we if if, if hundred percent of those people became psychotic, then it would be the same thing as psychosis. So so that this is this is the thinking that then led into the staging idea and applying that in psychiatry. So our initial approach to staging was basically we've defined a phenotype, which we did in, in the early 90s in Melbourne, uh, with, with a higher risk of transition to stage two, which was the psychotic episode, um, maybe 30, 40% in those days. Um, and our target was to predict these later stage conditions but with a very tunnel vision approach to it, I must say, in hindsight. And over time, we realized through data, like I just presented, that the, comp the situation was more complex and, and there were a lot more uh, overlapping uh, pathways and phenotypes. And the, the things we call schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are really what we call late macrophenotypes. And, and the early stages are what you could call microphenotypes, which are quite unstable. And, and a bit unpredictable as well. So we started to think about transdiagnostic approaches, thinking if you're going to have a model of care, a staging model, a model of diagnosis, um, it has to have a transdiagnostic focus in relation to the, the syndromes of the DSM. 
written, written some papers about that. Also, the biomarkers that we're, we're studying, we've studied them traditionally within DSM-type syndromes and, and uh, almost like silos of research. And um, actually, these biomarkers might, might relate just as much to stage of illness as they do to, to actually current syndromes, including CHR, I would say, as well. So um, colleagues in, in, in Sydney and in other parts of the world, including Canada, have been working on this for about 15 years. And the idea is that um, these things differentiate out over time. It's not totally true because you have comorbidity at all stages of illness. And the biomarkers might actually change according to stage and, and syndrome as well. I can't really show that on this slide, but maybe the next one might show it a bit better. So the biomarkers are those wiggly lines which change over time and maybe change across different um, syndromes as well. So this is another way of looking at it, which is congruent with RDOC, except RDOC doesn't have this developmental or, or staging type of concept, which is really a clinical concept meant to guide clinical trials and treatment, which and you see it very clearly in cancer and other areas of medicine where the stage of the illness is just as important as diagnosis in terms of what sort of treatments you offer and then the risks and benefits of those treatments. So it's a quite a heuristically powerful idea, which is still not really for everyday use, but it's something we try to feed into this, this new ecosystem thinking. So the other Dutch-inspired sort of um, dimension of research was this idea of network analysis and complex systems theory. Um, I haven't got time to go into this. It's pretty glad he is not here because he's a bit of an expert in this, this, in this work as well. Um, but uh, the complexity of, of, of the way people develop psychiatric syndromes is hopefully that's something we can capture in, in um, AMP schizophrenia with the power of the statistics that's going to be devoted to this um, due course. So, so this is going to be some idea. I don't know if I can do it on this uh, computer, but oh, yeah, it's, it's okay. So, the relationship on the left between different symptom clusters. Varies, varies over time, and you have to have very fine grain data to sort of. Sorry. Yeah, so the EMA data, ecological, ecological momentary assessment data around those symptoms appearing over time, and, and, the, and the bonds between the symptoms and uh, um, increasing or decreasing. And at the point of, let's say, conversion to psychosis, you might see um, certain, certain things becoming more stable and clear. So that's just an example of how you can use these techniques to sort of map the onset of, of uh, the, these syndromes and conditions. Now, I'm going to segue now into treatment. And um, just want to mention something that Josh mentioned this morning, the youth mental health crisis. While we were having a nice time in have schizophrenia studying, you know, the opposite of psychosis and schizophrenia, in the real world, there's a very serious deterioration in the mental health of, of the age group and, and uh, the young people who are actually studying. Um, the US Surgeon General to refer to it as a youth mental health crisis. It's not just in the States. There's really, really good evidence in other high-income countries, at least, that the instance of a broad range of mental conditions in young people is increasing steadily over the last 15 years or so. Obviously, the pandemic didn't do it any, any good, but um, it was happening before that. So in Australia, we, we did a mental health survey, first one for 15 years um, in two, 2021. Um, in, 2020, in, 20, in 2007, the prevalence of mental disorders in the 15 to 24 age group was 26% in a given year. In, in 2021, it had risen to 39%. So that's two out of five young people meeting the criteria for a DSM level need for care type diagnosis, which is, is, is pretty alarming. And the, the reasons for that are not understood. A lot of speculation, but um, it's something that's relevant to the context of what our research is about today. So just touching on that, that's a whole lecture in itself, that whole youth mental health crisis and what, what is being done about it in different countries. But I'm just gonna, last part of the talk is about current and new treatments. So this is a meta-analysis done 10 years ago by Mark van der Kaag from the Netherlands, showing pretty positive results for pretty much any treatment that was offered to the clinical high-risk group. 
most of these treatments were cognitive behaviorally inspired or influenced. Some of them were combination studies with low dose antipsychotics. Some of them were fish oil, I think, maybe one of them. Um, and the results were favoring intervention. Now, no one intervention was was better than, than, than any other, but, but working with these patients and helping them did seem to benefit them and it reduced the transition rate. Now, then our friends in, 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 in the net meta-analysis business got to work on it, and this is a network net meta-analysis, which basically because of the failure of one treatment to be superior to another, they concluded that the treatment doesn't work, which, which seemed to be a bit overly pessimistic to us. And then this met this Cochrane review done by people in Croatia um, came out and, and, and was very unusual because it sort of said antipsychotics were for, were supported more or less and, and uh, fish oil, even though a major study had been done by us which showed that fish oil didn't work, um, that, that they got that wrong too. So the quality of these and the interpretation of these studies was such that we felt that we needed, I'll come back to that one. Um, that we needed to respond. So we wrote it, uh, responses, Barnaby and I, in um, Lancet Psychiatry and JAMA Psychiatry, just pointing out the flaws in, the, in these uh, analyses and how it was dangerous in a way because it was basically giving comfort to people that were saying we shouldn't be helping or working with these patients clinically. And we all know that these patients are very significantly unwell, functionally impaired, distressed, and suicidal risk, as you saw this morning. So. So we really felt we had to sort of put a more positive statement here in the journals, and, and uh, I think we dealt with that reasonably well. At the same time, you had people in the UK criticizing the idea that we should be working with these patients in, in a sense of at least in, in terms of at-risk mental, mental health clinics, you know, um, prodromal clinics. And they did have some good points because it's still only a minority of patients that can get into those clinics in the, in the right time in the stage of illness. But, um, but there are solutions to that. So again, it, it was excessive pessimism for reasons which are a little bit unclear. So we decided to have another look at the evidence base properly um, 10 years after the Mark van der Kaag meta-analysis. And, and um, this, is, this is one narrative review that we did published in schizophrenia research. And then perhaps a more systematic one, um, uh, and a, a proper meta-analysis was done in clinical psychology review. And that appeared, I think, a year later. So by this stage, there were at least 26 RCTs that could be included in, um, in this meta-analysis, which is another, is, is double the number than, than what had been um, available 10 years early. So tremendous efforts have gone on to try to you know, study the treatment of this of this stage of illness. And um, what, what our meta-analysis showed was that in terms of transition rates, there, there, there was a favorable effect, particularly of the, of the CBT orientated therapies or cognitive behavioral case management. So it, it wasn't uh, super strong, you could say. It was a significant reduction of risk of transition within the first 12 months, but it was definitely clinically important and was there. Um, and if you look at attenuated symptoms, the positive symptoms, also there was a there was an effect to benefit that dimension of, of, uh, of outcome. So we could say um, that psychosis incidence, at least in the short term, so treatment can uh, transition can be delayed. Um, it could be reduced by forty five percent at twelve months, and even by forty percent further down the track if you look at the Dutch data in particular from Mark van der Kaag. Um, which is a significant finding when you think nothing else has been able to halt the onset of psychosis in the last hundred years. So it's something to be uh, sort of valued to, to some extent. Now, on the other hand, if you look at other outcomes like depression, anxiety, social and, and, and uh, occupational functioning, um, there, was, there were really no effects of the therapies on that. And that's, that's a, a that's a real problem because those are the things that are probably very important to patients in, um, in a sense. So, so we've got the therapies we have probably affect the positive symptom dimension, but they, they're, they're too linear or too narrow in their focus. That was the, the, the outcome that, we, uh, that we, we came up with. So that guides what should be done next. The secondary outcomes in that study weren't were really unaffected. So we, we should be in no way satisfied with, with the, what we've got to so far. Um, 
Okay, so what does that say? Yeah, it's basically saying that we need to look at better design trials um, and also um, novel interventions such as the one that Philip has just been talking about. So that led us to approach, um, we we'll, we'll submit a, um, a funding um, protocol or, or submission to NIMH, who funded what's called, again, it must be the only name acronym that exists in this area, it's called STEP as well. So, um, but we call it STEP because it was a staged study. It was a, it was a smart trial, which means it's an, a, um, a sequential adaptive trial. And which mirrors pretty much what clinicians would do in this situation. It's not just testing one uh, set of comparisons, it's a series of nested randomized control, uh, control trials. That's what it looked like. So the patients would come in at the front end, and they would be offered supportive therapy for the first few weeks, really to, to, to actually exclude the patients that would respond to just simple support. Um, um, and, and don't really have a high level of risk for progression or into psychosis. That was the idea behind it. And we assumed that maybe 50% of people would be in that category. It turned out that only 20% were. So, so this is actually a more serious condition than, than people have, have actually uh, understood. So anyway, the non-responders to that phase, and by the way, in this trial, we, we set the response definition at a much higher bar than in previous studies. In previous studies, the primary outcome was transition to psychosis. Here, it was full remission of, of, of the subthreshold psychotic symptoms, complete remission, plus functional recovery. Um, so, so psychosocial functional recovery as well, which is hard to meet, a hard set of criteria to meet. And um, so the people that didn't respond at the first phase, the walkout sort of phase, were randomized to cognitive behavioral case management or continuing supportive therapy. For, for a number of months. And again, if they didn't respond to that, they were there, then added, um, they were randomized to uh, adding fluoxetine to the um, behavioral case management. In other words, testing whether adding additional or specific treatments on one on top of the other was going to lead to a progressive level of response. That was the idea. And that's called a SMART trial, an adaptive trial. And it's adapting to whether the patient's responding or not, which is what clinicians do. And then they were no better. This is about nine months or so into, 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 the, into the trial. Um, they would be offered um, a choice of uh, omega-3 fatty acids or antipsychotic medication. And, and uh, I'll show you the results in a minute. So this is about to appear. It's, um, I think, a week or two away from publication. And basically, I'll go through it in a little bit more detail in a minute, but I mean, we were able to randomize 342 individuals within a two year period in our local environment in Melbourne, um, around Origin, through our Headspace centers and, and our specialist programs. That was, um, um, I think, a great achievement by the team. And I've got to pay tribute to Melissa Kerr and, and uh, Barnaby and, and everybody else that worked on that study, Jessica uh, uh, Spark as well. They did a great job. Um, so we could not show an advantage of the more specialized treatments in step two, um, the more specialized psychological treatment, and we couldn't show any advantage of, of the um, SSRIs either. So I'm just getting near the end here now. That's the consort trial that shows the patient flow. Here are the outcome measures. You can see there was improvement on, on every measure over, over the, over the follow-up period. So the patients did slowly get better but they didn't recover or go into remission so to, that we would be satisfied with overall. And there was no advantage of, of the more high power treatments, if you like, um, over, over the more very simple monitoring and support. So that's really what I've just said. Um, remission rates were lower than expected. Um, transition rate was slightly higher than expected. Even when remission was achieved, it was difficult to maintain, it was brittle and the continuing support didn't reduce the relapse rates compared to just monitoring alone. So the findings suggest um, that the intensity of treatment increasing it um, um, didn't improve, um, didn't produce more benefit other than just simple support, supportive care. But caution is required. Maybe we, we, we can't really say that too strongly because we did set the bar for remission very high. Um, 
if, if, if it had just been based on symptomatic recruitment, improvement, the remission rate would be increased um, to 41 percent instead of 27 percent. Treatment discontinuation was substantial, as it is in all of these trials, especially if you're trying to do it for more than a few weeks, if you're trying to do it for a full year, especially this complex design. Um, people do drop out. It's comparable to the dropout in STAR D, a similar trial of depression. And the adherence to the, to, to the detail, of the, you know, the, the quality of those treatments, whether it was the antidepressant or the cognitive behavior therapy, was suboptimal. Um, so adherence rates were much lower than we, we would really like to see. So maybe we didn't fully test those, those treatments properly. Um, so for that reason, we, we ought to still often need space care to these patients, but the results probably need uh, indicate the need for not just further sequential trials, but introducing new options like virtual reality powered CBT, you know, which is definitely a possibility now, but might work, work, make it work a lot better, make it more attractive. Um, individual placement support. We, we want functional recovery, but we, we should probably focus on functional interventions, not just you know drug and psychological treatments. There's really good evidence for that. And then new biotherapies, such as Philip um, was talking about, what good details there. But there are options here, and hopefully, with um, AMP schizophrenia, the, the purpose of this project is to produce new options. So, really, that's very much congruent with uh, what we're trying to do here. And I think we've got to also, as Dominic said this morning, we've got to really find out how to, if we can, um, it's a big problem across the whole of psychiatry, to find the, the heterogeneity within these samples so that we, we find treatment relevant subgroups so, um, so, uh, that people respond to some things but not others. That's pretty obvious. So um, I think I just skip that and I just acknowledge that these are pressing investigators. And, and I'd also like not just the investigators, but acknowledge all the people who actually do all the hard work you know, um, in, um, engaging the patients, following them up and looking after them during the study, such as my colleagues here in the front row. So, um, and everyone who's working on this on both networks um, around the world. So thank you very much for listening. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, any questions? Well, I think in, in any trial that we've ever done, we've done about six of these in clinical high risk. We've done others in other other diagnostic groups, but functioning always lags behind. The functional recovery always lags behind the symptomatic recovery. But you know, it was kind of very um, earth shattering when we when we started to do IPS research. Um, in early stage illness, uh, Lowen Talaki and Gina Chinri did these studies. We saw a massive boost in functional, in functional recovery that wouldn't have flowed just from narrow drug and psychological therapy treatments alone. Um, so and this is something that's really woven into, into clinical trials like this. So, so I just think that we, there is, it's really, we've got to have a number of treatment targets. We're assuming that all we've got to do is find the biological key and, and or, the, or the symptom reduction key and everything's going to be fine. Well, is, as we all know, recovery is a much more complex process than that. So I think that, that's one thing to say. And, and that, that's why I was very concerned by the results of those very thoughtless, you know, meta-analyses and, and, um, and, and uh, Cochrane reviews, which didn't understand by trashing 
you know, what, what we what we can do to help um, in the way that they did is going to put patients at risk, you know, because we see these patients, they're, they're suicidal, they're, they're really struggling, and they, they, they can be helped, but they don't fully recover with, without something else. So, so we should be putting all our efforts into, you know, new drugs, new, new superpowered psychological therapies, and, and, and actually putting IPS vocational recovery right there in the mix, because these are young people in a highly vulnerable stage of their lives, and I've transitioned to adult life, and they don't get a social type of support, and, which is also quite technical, um, then they're not going to get better. Thank you. That's a really good Thanks. That's a great question. I, I, I didn't have time to really go into it, but if you have a chance to read the paper when it comes out, we, we do mention this. But one of the findings was that even if people did go into, into remission and, 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 and did well, um, it was brittle. It was brittle. So it was a little bit like when you've already developed, you know, a first episode that the relapse rates could be quite high. So so I think the duration of treatment in our ultra high risk clinics is only six months is all that. And I think that it, for that data, it really shows it needs to be at least a year or two. Or so. Well, we don't know how long actually, but very from patient to patient. It's the same with the first episode and, um, data, which obviously John and, and uh, everybody else do a great job in, in producing the, the data that, uh, for um, you know showing you know, the first two years are very critical. But then other other studies have shown, including you know, the long term follow up of the Opus study, that beyond beyond the first two years, you get a drift back to the north the outcomes you would have had anyway. And, and that to me is an indictment of what happens to the patients after they leave these first episode of early psychosis programs, that they do not get what they need to maintain their recovery so and to stay well. And remember Ron Kessler once saying, we put all this effort into getting people well, and then we don't put almost zero effort into keeping them well. And I'm sure John would agree with that. He's been campaigning about aspects of that for a long time. So yeah, I think, the duration of treatment is really important because the systems are so underfinanced and underfunded, they just provide revolving door care a lot of the time. And so we we put so much effort into doing our best to, to, to get that recovery. And then how do we how do we maintain it? That's another whole, whole set of questions, isn't it? Thank you. 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 Thank you.